University. Um, as Nick has already said this morning, this is the first of what will hopefully be a series of knowledge exchange events based on our current research outputs at Forest Research. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Forest Research has a five year program of uh, core research, which is based on the priorities set and agreed by the devolved administrations in England, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, these priorities form the basis of seven research programs, which are published in the current version of the Science and Innovation Strategy for Great Britain. Um, and that runs until April 2026. I'll put up a link at the end to the um, strategy so that you can delve into it in more detail if you're interested. Um, so details are available on, on the Forest Research website. So just to run through the um, seven programmes, uh, programme one is uh, sustainable forest management in the light of environmental change. Program two, which is the program that instigated, I think, this talk this morning, is Markets for Forest Products and Services. Program three is Societal Benefits of Trees, Woods and Forests. Program four is Resource Assessment uh, and Sector Monitoring. So that's really NFI and uh, statistics. Uh, program five is achieving multiple ecosystem benefits. Program six, woodland creation and expansion, which is obviously um, something that is uh, talked about a lot in Wales, as is program seven, tree health and biosecurity. So as I've already said, today's program is based mainly on, or today's um, session is based mainly on program two, markets for forest products and other services but very much crosses into other programs. And I'm delighted to be joined um, by a number of um, FR colleagues this morning, uh, a number of whom are online, but particularly my old friend, Robert Matthews, who I haven't seen for a number of years, unfortunately, but it's lovely to see him again, um, who's traveled up from Hampshire uh, to be here today and will be pre presenting later this morning. Okay, I'm um, oh, sorry, I should have clicked on to those earlier. Apologies for that. Um, if you're interested in the... If you're interested in looking at the um, research outputs, there is uh, information on the, also the program of research. It is available on the website at forestresearch.gov.uk forward slash about us core research programs. That um, QR code, if you want to take a photograph of it, should take you directly to that um, link. And Gail, I'm happy for this to be circulated afterwards to make it easier for people to, to get there. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy your day. And oh, Sheila as well, who I haven't, also haven't seen for a while. I was editing the Seeds database yesterday to try and pass so through. It's a, your legacy still lasts. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Hi. Yeah. Um, uh, well, morning. Um, circumstances mean that I wasn't able to travel to be with you in person today, but um, I'm thrilled to still have the chance to share some of our work. Um, and as the first event in this series, I do hope that there will be opportunities for us to meet face to face in the future. I'm Gail Atkinson. I lead the Climate Change Research Group, uh, Forest Research, and my presentation is going to focus on some work to better understand 
how we can adapt our forest and woodland management to the changing climate. I must stress that this uh, work has been very much a collaborative effort. So drawing on uh, decades of research and expertise from across forest research. Day to day, the research aspects of my work are um, focused in on uh, better understanding the risks and opportunities to forests uh, and woodland associated with the changing climate um, and what forest owners and managers uh, are doing to understand climate change and better prepare for it and how forest research can strategically support this transition um, in understanding and in practice. Uh, next slide please. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to introduce some of the work uh, that sits behind our UKFS uh, practice guide, the case studies and other resources um, and forest researches at climate change hub. I think I've got 20 minutes. So um, if you would like to make a note of your questions, I'm aiming, aiming to have some time uh, to take those at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So the climate in Wales, uh, we know that it's changing and it's projected to change with an increase in uh, mean temperature in all regions of Wales uh, in all seasons, including milder winters with fewer days of ground frost and lying snow. And they're likely to be changes in the seasonal rainfall patterns with this sort of wetter winters, uh, wetter autumns and drier springs and summers and unfortunately um, an increase in extreme weather events um, and, and storm events. In terms of the climate change impacts, um, these changes in climate uh, will have a range of impacts on forestry um, uh, in, uh, including um, we're expecting an increased risk of wind and storm damage and the occurrence of landslides and wildfire risk uh, is also increasing. There's the increase uh, increased spring uh, and summer drought risk, particularly in, in South Wales. Um, and later dormancy uh, could increase Lammas, uh, late, that late season growth uh, and affect timber quality. There's also concerns around um, earlier bud burst, uh, changing or increasing the risk of spring frost damage and the increasing risk of flooding and water logging. Um, but the longer, warmer growing seasons um, could in increase tree growth uh, where other factors such as water availability and nutrients uh, are not limited. So the adverse effects from climate change can increase susceptibility of forests to insect pests and uh, or path pathogen damage. And the, the changing climate will also allow the range and population of some pests and pathogens to expand. So resulting in an increased risk of damage uh, and tree mortality um, for new and existing pests and diseases. So a combination of mitigation and adaptation strategies are needed to help efforts to mitigate climate change and increase the resilience of our forests and woodlands as the climate continues to change and the frequency of extreme events um, increases. So this is following advice from the um, Tyndall Centre to adapt for four degree uh, rise and the associated changes. So the, the slide that you can see now um, highlights the main risks to forests and woodland from, from the changing climate. And I'm going to focus in on risks um, today rather than opportunities. So there's this increasing awareness that we need to adapt. We need to adapt our forests and woodland management to the changing uh, climate to help society adapt. And that the better prepared we are, the more likely trees are to grow and to grow well. And trees that are growing well are going to sequester more optimal amounts of carbon and deliver those ecosystem services that we really value. Um, so uh, several of the biggest challenges are around developing that evidence base to inform how and when it's most appropriate to take action um, uh, to, to act um, for the changing climate. Raising awareness um, about the risks, I think it's is fair to say that's also one of our challenges. And then lastly, thinking about changing behaviour, especially in light of the uncertainty. How can we support and encourage um, owners and managers to look ahead and manage their land uh, under a changing climate informed by the latest research and support those who are willing and able to take that step, try something different um, and learn from their experiences. Next slide, please. So understanding the barriers um, to the uptake of adaptive practice is key to progress. And I wanted to share this uh, landowner quote 
captured from research with owners and managers um, that I worked on with our head of society and environment research group uh, and social scientist Bianca Ambrose OG. So as you can read, I just need something easy, clear and practical. It has to be based on science. Yes, yes, lots of science, but I need it in a language I can understand with advice I can actually act on. And this need for guidance has been echoed in other research strands um, with the sector from 2017 and 2018. Um, and our improved understanding of the barriers to, to adaptation has led to the creation of uh, an adaptation trail uh, at, here at Alice Holt, uh, where I am today, uh, a suite of adaptation case studies, the creation of which has informed um, aspects of our research, a new uh, UKFS practice guide, which I'll get onto in a minute, um, and a series of climate change fact sheets, um, with one of these directly related to adaptation and another on uh, climate change risks as part of a, a larger suite. It's also informed the creation of the new climate change hub. Uh, next slide, please. So our UKFS practice guide was published in May 2022. Um, it provides advice on how to adapt management and plan uh, for the changing climate. It's been written for owners and managers, policy makers and planners, uh, and provides an adaptation framework so that the reader can work through the process of choosing and implementing uh, adaptation measures. Um, and I stress again that this has been very much a collaborative effort with authors contributing to this from across forest research, working together to bring together the latest insights from research and practice. Um, particularly important um, for the, all those who've been involved in, in this document and the case studies that, that uh, accompany it, in part because one of the barriers to the uptake of adaptive practice um, had uh, previously been uh, around disparate information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the guide's been well received. We've had some positive feedback and sustained interest. So you can see here it was covered as a SIEM um, feature article. Next slide, please. Uh, and when I was researching the conspectus for what is now the practice guide, there's a lot of demand for case studies. So we've developed a suite of these, sometimes from scratch. And I, when I say from scratch, I literally mean um, identifying forests and woodlands on private and public forest estates looking at the management objectives, the climate change risks, working through to operations and adapting areas uh, of Alice Holt and private woodland and everything associated with that to create some of these real world, world case studies um, which are, uh, accompany the guide. We launched with seven case studies uh, and since then have released more, um, bringing the total to 12 uh, with more in the pipeline. And a nice example is Klokleinog uh, number seven, which was written by my colleague, uh, Victoria Stokes. The forest, uh, you may know, is in the northeast of Wales, managed by NRW and extends over 4,000 uh, hectares. It was planted with predominantly uh, coniferous species in the late 20th century. A uh, number of stands are now in their second rotation and, and much of the forest is over 350 metres above sea level. It's a really nice example to look at um, in part because of its history. Um, Back in 2001, the FC established a national network of trial sites looking to increase understanding of um, continuous cover uh, silviculture in British forestry. Um, it's a silvicultural approach that looks to create more diverse forests, both structurally and in species composition. And large parts of Klokleinog have been managed using the CCF principles since then. The site was also selected as an intensive, intensive even research area to examine different methods of transforming even age stands to CCF and better understand their impacts on the growth and yield of stands and on regenerating trees uh, in the understory. So opportunities to use CCF as an adaptation measure are increasingly recognised and this was highlighted in the last British Woodland Survey. The development of more diverse forests should really help reduce the risks posed by the changing climate uh, and um, increasing biotic threats. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Someone's gone back. Who's that? Back again. Um, no, sorry. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so when we were, uh, we also led some scoping work several years ago for a bespoke climate change online resource with a range of senior stakeholders, including uh, Mark Hilliard. We then secured some funding from the countries to, to create a climate change hub. And this enabled us to bring in uh, our hub manager, Kirsten Monk, to really create and develop um, uh, the hub. The steering group had good representatives um, from the three countries uh, and the forestry and climate change partnerships that includes FR, DEFRA, COMFOR, ICF, RFS, a whole host of other organisations really supported the launch of the hub, uh, promoting it to their members. So you may have come across it. Uh, Kirsten was at the Royal Welsh show uh, following the launch and the first phase of development was really focused on um, the topic of climate change adaptation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the aim of the hub is to encourage changes in uh, UK forestry practice and management to address climate change threats. So our plan was to achieve this by developing a really dynamic, engaging one stop shop um, that provides practical information mm -hmm. uh, and guidance. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of target audience, we have to date focused content primarily at owners and managers, um, and we're gaining feedback uh, and data around uh, users of the site. Um, so we'll be able to assess and reassess whether our content is reaching these audiences and whether we're providing the type of information um, that's required. Next slide, please. It's a distilled interactive version of the practice guide with additional information um, and language tailored to a more practitioner audience. We've included information on climate change risks, adaptation measures, uh, decision making tools. We include our adaptation framework, the case studies, the fact sheets, the videos and some ad hoc uh, news items. Next slide, please. And as with all websites, you know, we, we were um, working, we we're working to keep the hub really visual and engaging. So this has involved some really great uh, or well received video content, um, including the production of some new adaptation videos, um, including interviews with both forestry research colleagues uh, and landowner representatives. There's also an adaptation trail video filmed at Alice Holt so that we can share our knowledge and experience with a wider audience um, and some nice drone footage to really help bring um, what we've been doing around adaptation to life. You see, as you can see from the still on the screen, which shows uh, Willow's Green on the adaptation trail where we are demonstrating the use of a more a local and a more southerly provenance of oak. Uh, next slide, please. So the hub's live and we're finding the interactive content is really helping bring some of the principles around adaptation to life. Um, so that was phase one, the focused around adaptation. Um, we've been then, uh, we've also been successful in securing some more funding, um, which will enable us to expand the scope of the hub and include uh, content around climate change mitigation. So that's really keeping everyone busy um, at the moment. But at the moment, um, if you visit the hub, you'll find it's, it's uh, content that's available at the moment is still focused on adaptation. Next slide, please. Um, so you'll find pages around the six main climate change risks, and these feature relevant case studies and links to adaptation measures for each risk. Next slide, please. So for example, on the frost page, you'll see we've signposted um, through to relevant adaptation measures to help reduce uh, and better manage frost damage. Next slide, please. On our adaptation measures page, um, there's a, a useful table um, where, which you'll also find in the UKFS practice guide. Um, the, the key shows which adaptation measures are likely to reduce the impacts of climate change risks if applied appropriately. And there's also information on each of our adaptation measures uh, pages. Next slide, please. Um, there's also uh, the opportunity to download the practice guide uh, via a form. And I, I mention this because um, the full practice guide is really useful. It has information that you'll find on the Climate Change Hub about risks and adaptation measures, but in a lot more detail. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
and there's the five step framework uh, in both the practice guide and in the take action section of the hub with a click through graphic um, and links to uh, more information. Next slide, please. Um, and the, the there were a number of requests for um, checklists. So um, uh, here we include a list of things to consider when planning for adaptation, um, which we hope owners and managers are finding useful. Um, and this is through this is on the the take action page. Next slide, please. So. In the advice section, we've included official country guidance uh, as a landing page. And from here, you can visit our individual country pages where you'll find specific policy and governance information. Um, so we link through to the uh, summary of key findings and recommendations for climate change in Wales, which includes an overview of adapting forests and woodlands, uh, link through to NRW um, guidance uh, and resources. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, case study uh, number seven around Clocklinog transitioning to CCF. Um, I would be very keen to develop more case studies around adapting uh, forest and man uh, woodland management to climate change in Wales. So if anything springs to mind, um, do get in touch. Um, our resources section uh, has information around some of our decision support tools that are being used to help owners and managers assess their own sites. So, for example, the ecological site classification tool known as ESC is linked through here. Um, and we've also, as I mentioned earlier, centralised the climate change fact sheets um, and highlighted some of the key um, climate change publications. I've had some really nice feedback on the hub. Um, Ian Baker, for example, former chief exec of Small Woodland uh, Small Woodlands Association, um, said he thought the hub was really, really well put together and packed with really useful uh, information and measures. Um, and uh, I think that's nice. That it's very reassuring um, to uh, start to have that sort of positive uh, feedback um, from those who are using it as well. Um, so thanks ever so much for listening. I really hope this gives you a flavour of some of our work. I'm happy to take questions, but if you'd prefer to ask something direct, um, do feel free to get in touch. Uh, my email is via my staff page uh, on the link. Sorry, next slide. Uh, and next slide. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you prefer to ask something direct, um, given that I'm not present in person, do feel free that you can get in touch. My email address is via the staff link, uh, which is on the slide. We may have questions online, but it's also possible for you to ask questions of Gail from the group. My colleague John has a microphone at the back, and my colleague Pat has one here. So if you put your hand up, and when you're asking the question, it would be helpful if you said who you are and who you're here to know. Thank you. Thank you. So are there any questions in the room? But online. No, online. No? Okay. Do you have a question? Whether it's a question in the room coming? Hi, Gail. Um, it's Eve from NRW. I was wondering, and I should know this, how the work you've been doing, which is really useful, links to the forest development types. Yeah, thank you. That's a really nice uh, question. Um, yeah, uh, both the um, UKFS practice guide and the climate change hub signpost through to forest development type um, <clears throat> pages. Um, yeah, and we're keen to encourage that, um, uh, the use of that. Um, so yeah, the, so there's a link through there. Nope. Does that? It's really hard to, to catch. We're just checking if there's any more questions in the room. Anybody got any questions? Okay, 
So, well, thank you very much, Gail. That's wonderful. And we've got your details. We'll forward any other questions on that come up during the day if they're relevant to you afterwards. And thanks for presenting. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to Chris Reynolds' presentation, which will also be online. So after the coffee break, Robert Matthews will present in person in the room. So if Chris is ready. Right. I'm going to whiz through the slides then because they're not in the right order, Gail. So just bear with. Okay. Um, okay. Nope. Or just twice a bit. Just a moment. That's happened. Um, I, I could share moment. and present from this end. Yeah, did you want to um, share screen um, um, now, Chris, if that's right? So I shall share it. I'll do a share then, shall I? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Has that come up? Yeah, that's um, all right now. Thanks. Yeah, it suits, suits me quite a lot because I've got lots of animation, which I've been saying click, 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 click constantly all the way through. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, ready when you are? Yep. Marvellous. OK, um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Uh, I'm Chris Reynolds. I lead on species research for forest research. And of course, I have a UK remit. Uh, we won't get political, but as I keep saying to people, trees don't respect boundaries. So my work is very much looking at what species require to be able to grow them successfully. And then it's really up to land managers to pick and choose from the list and the information that I provide. Um, so thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so what I'm looking at is what is species research? Is it going to come up? Yes. So what, what are we talking about on emerging species? And uh, this is really the title of the work that I do. And it's looking at a range of um, uh, operational processes, research trials, uh, seeking out source information so that we can improve our knowledge on this range of on a wider range of species. And it's divided up into four categories. You've got principal species, and those are the ones we, we understand. They're the ones that are grown widely. Uh, we don't need to do a huge amount of work on them. We're always tinkering, maybe, especially with genetics. But generally, we understand these species. Behind that, you have what we call secondary species. And the secondary species are those where uh, they're fairly widely planted across Britain. Um, but we are maybe lacking a certain amount of knowledge, and that's particularly on things like provenances and maybe how best to adapt them, how best to deploy them, you know, whether we should be using them for underplanting, what sort of constraints there are. Some species don't like exposure. There's a whole range of things that we're, we're just trying to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge. Below that, you've got what we call plot stage, and this is really part of that early assessment and I'll bring up a couple of examples of that later on where we've planted many species over the years and we've probably trialled over 500 since the early days of the Forestry Commission. Uh, th and these have been planted out in plots and old forest gardens across the entire forestry estate in all the countries. And we still have this fantastic legacy of material out there that we can call upon. And of course, they're now trees, so we can actually see how they've, they've done. This is a long term process. But it all kicks off a lot of it is with our what we call specimen stage. And again, I shall bring a little bit more information up later on. But specimen stage is what assets have we got where we can go and see the potential of a species that we could maybe then put into plots um, and then move them up the ladder. 
But most of my work is concentrated on filling the gaps in the two main, two secondary and plot stage species, where we've got quite a lot of information already, but we just need to improve that information. So what we can do then is move them up the ladder and basically make them a principal species. As I've said before, this is a very long term process. I am picking up on the coattails of many dendrologists and species silviculturists from before me. Um, and I'm really looking at uh, a lot of their knowledge and and exploring what they've done in the past. So why is there such an urgency? And I think this is just generally fairly well known. As you can see, about half of British forests are broadleaf and the other half are conifers. And if you look at the conifers in particular, and that's what I'm going to be really concentrating on today, is what research we're doing on improving our knowledge on a productive conifer species. Over half of all the conifers planted in this country are one species, Sitka spruce. And, you know, taking that into context, that's a quarter of all woodland. So there's a massive, massive risk there. Um, and we really do need to think about diversifying that, that mix of productive conifer species. And you can even see from there, of course, larch make up quite a big chunk of the about 8% of all the woodlands. Um, and we're basically losing large as a productive species. Corsican pine makes up 3%. And again, we're losing that really as a productive species. So there's quite an impetus now to, to do a lot more work on getting us a wider range of species that we are confident in being able to grow. And um, what are the other things that are affecting it? Well, of course, a massive increase in the pests and diseases. And I mean, we all know about Phytophthora, uh, there's things like chestnut blight, but the one that's really a very big concern at the moment is Ipstopographus, which is, of course, as has been identified in Kent and East Anglia. And there are control measures in place to try and get rid of uh, woodland that have the um, this particular beast. And this is basically Norway spruce and other spruces. I was asked a question a little while ago. If I've got to get rid of all my Norway spruce, Chris, what spruce can I put back in? I said, you can't. You know, Ips will eat spruce. That, that's that's the short end of it. And that's a species we do not want to be able to be spreading across the wider country. Uh, and there's a huge amount of effort being done by our entomology teams and other researchers at Alice Holt to identify the best ways of tackling and dealing with this species. Uh, we know it's here. We're in the process of trying to eradicate it, but that will be an ongoing process because it's a, a European native. It's always going to be on the doorstep waiting to come in. Um, but that's a, a subject for another conversation, really. Um, and of course, climate change, that's the, the, the key one that we are um, all trying to deal with. We're trying to figure out what the best options are for diversifying our forests, looking at um, where these species are being grown in the country. And you can see really what it's is we're going to get a change in precipitation. We're going to get more winter rain and less summer rain. That's the predictions. And that's across the country. Um, you know, there are thoughts, actually, parts of the west of the country are likely to get warmer and wetter. Um, and that may well suit some of our productive species and certainly suit Sitka. Um, but of course, that also brings the issues of warmer, wetter winters, warmer, wetter summers, maybe increased amounts of disease. So there's a whole load of things we're trying to deal with. But the fundamental for me is to try and come up with a wider range of species that we've got good knowledge on how to grow, taking into consideration some of these constraints. So what are we doing? Well, as I say, there's a long history of trialing in this country. And we have, like I say, thousands of old experiments. Many of these are now closed, but it's, uh, it's worth sometimes a revisit. I've went back to a site in Kent where a, a series of fast growing broad, broadleaves have been planted. And having had conversations with foresters and like on along the lines, if you see anything odd, give me a shout. And this is one when they came back and said, Chris, there's some massive broadleaves in here, but we don't know where they've come from. And it's an old, closed, fast growing broadleaf trial. So we're now actually reopening that. And that's something that I'm trying to do across the country. And I'm hoping to visit a lot more sites in Wales of trials that have now been closed that I think would be very good to go back, reassess, because they'll give me a good idea of how things have done over time. The reason why they may have been closed is they could have been set up for as a, a trial to look at ground preparation 
or as an entomology experiment. But now from a silver cultural point of view, those trees are still there and they've got the opportunity to offer me some really good and interesting information so we can reopen, reopen them and repurpose them. So I'm looking to revisit a lot of these old trials. We've got a series of what we call operational species trials. Unfortunately, we haven't got any of these in Wales at the moment. Uh, they are ranging from the north of Scotland down through England. There's a series of these, and what we have is 21 species planted on 0.1 hectare plots, but replicated three times. So you've got 0.3 of a hectare of each of these species. And they're managed by the forest districts under their normal working practices. These are operational trials. We're looking at how these species behave by, you know, uh, by the normal, like I said, the normal practices undertaken by the districts. And it's quite obvious that, you know, if you're growing Sitka, you can't treat a lot of these species like you would be treating Sitka. If you're growing Corsican pine, you can't treat a lot of these species like you grow Corsican pine. So we're picking up a lot of very valuable information on these operational trials. And there's certainly these I would like to try and think, consider trying to take these into Wales. Uh, short rotation forestry trials. There's a series of these throughout England, Scotland and Wales. They are still being managed um, and we're still getting some good information. And there's, uh, there's a few of these um, scattered around through, through Wales. And they're particularly interesting probably to farming uh, or agroforestry. We are talking short rotation, so 15 to 20 years uh, on a wide range of species. Unsurprisingly, the species that do well in these are things like eucalyptus um, and whether you like eucalyptus or not is another question, but they have massive potential as a productive forestry species in the right place. We've been partnering a whole series of trials throughout Europe. Uh, this is, these were called Reinforce, and they were a network starting in the Azores and going all the way up to Mull. So we had 30 species with three provenances of each, and those trials are now about 12 years old. We're in the process of looking at reinforce two, so the next stage. Unfortunately, because these are interreg projects, we cannot actually get funding through Europe. But we're using the same partners, but we're also this time is including Ireland. And we are looking at ways of how we can interact with these trials uh, and able to get out the resources that are available um, and and looking at alternative sources of funding for us to be able to do these. And there is actually a reinforced trial in Wales, and I'll bring that up again a little bit later. So there's a whole range of these trials, and they're starting to give us some good information, but they're still quite young. You know, we've, we've, we, we, we need lots of time when you're studying the silver culture of trees. It is not a short process. We have a new generation of forestry research trials. So these are specific species trials Again, on larger scale numbers where we can good, good, do good statistical analysis. And we established five new trials um, back in about 2012. Uh, we've got one in Wales, uh, one in uh, two in England and uh, two in Scotland. And these are, again, starting to give us some good information. We've had a 10 year measure. We're looking to do another measure at year 15 and keep on managing these because they are giving us some quite useful data. Um, but like I say, this, these are new trials. You know, if you look back over the history of our species research, the massive amount of efforts went in up until the middle of the 1970s and early 1980s. And then we stopped. So we've got a 40 year gap, really, in knowledge. We settled on Sitka, we settled on Corsican, we settled on a small range of species that we decided were the best options and stopped species research. It's something now we really are now taking on in, in a lot bigger way and, and putting a lot more species um, trials in. And this is why we want to get involved with the new generation of reinforced trials. It's a great opportunity. We've been looking at things like um, how species have been deployed across England, and I'll mention this again a bit later. And we did a uh, quite a nice study on what was planted on the public forest estate on these emerging species. And again, I'll go into a bit more detail what we what what, what those species are. Um, and, and that showed us really or gave us a lot of information on, on the process of involved, what experiences what there were from practitioners, what went right, what went wrong. Um, surprisingly or not, there was quite a lot went wrong. These are new species that are planted on quite a wider scale, um, but we're getting very good information from those. And of course, we're using our net 
network of Arboreta for first age assessments. And that's not just those that are run and managed by, you know, Forestry England, uh, Forestry England, National Resources Wales and um, Forestry Land Scotland, but also those private collections and national collections like Kew and Edinburgh Botanics. We've got a massive resource there we can tap into when we're having a little bit of a think about hmm, what's out there we should be having a think about and, and, and doing some more work with. So just a, a short review on one or two of the things we are doing. There was a whole series of trials that were established about 15 years ago. Sorry, so they were established about 25 years ago. Um, what we're looking at now is uh, going back and reviewing them and seeing how they've done now they're 25 years old. They were written up at year 10, so we got an idea of how species were doing. So the sorts of things we're finding are still these nice 25-year-old stands of black walnut, uh, London Plain. Um, in this case, I think we've got it is Liriodendron, so the tulip tree. So these are potential alternative broadleaves. Um, some quite nice plots of giant redwood. Uh, that is one of the species I think that came out in the top five of potential species for whales uh, on the exercise carried out by Wood Knowledge Wales. Um, it's again, it's a species that's very much on our um, plot stage. We do not know a huge amount about it, and we are intending to do more with it. But there's some quite nice stands that we can start to get some good data from. The uh, Another series of tr uh, work we're looking at are the uh, uh, summarising a lot of the old, what you call forest research, seed origin trials. And these, again, were scattered right the way across the, the countries. Um, and there's been a whole series of those. Uh, this particular example is Thetford 73. This is a Western hemlock seed origin trial. You can just make out a lot of the posts there uh, where it gives that gives you the, the seed origins of all of those uh, different um, provenances. Uh, these are providing us with some good information on if there are any differences within the provenances. Um, and as an example, uh, Abies alba, which um, has, I think, a lot of potential as a, as a forestry tree in the future. Uh, the particular provenance that did quite well is the one that comes from Calabria in the toe of Italy. So it's got a little bit more adaptation to a Mediterranean climate. And the reason why it's isolated down there, it's what they call a refugia. It was left over after the last ice age. So it's been sitting there slowly adapting and it has showed better uh, properties than the other Abies alba provenances. It's just getting hold of material is, 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 is an issue. But these are providing us with a great deal of information, very valuable information. And all of these trials, all, all of these papers were written up and they are available on the forestry research um, web pages uh, under provenance. Uh, and of course, the other thing is, is going out and writing up these. This is an example of one of those seed origin trials. trials. This was for Cryptomera Japonica and Sequoia sempervirens, both species that um, do fairly well in Welsh conditions. And I think they came up as number one and number two on the list of species for whales, um, again, that were carried out by um, Wood Knowledge Wales. And Sometimes just looking at you know what species are again. This is going back to reviewing. We have this massive database and massive list of wonderful old trials out on the public forest estates, and we're just gleaning them. We're mining them for information constantly. And this particular paper is written up by now the late Bill Mason, bless him, um, passed away at the weekend. Um, you know, he's, he had a massive involvement there and he's, he, he wrote, uh, wrote a paper up uh, a few years ago now, just summarising how some of those species have done. Uh, where have we got these trials? And you can see from the map on the left there, we've got, you know, it's, well, gosh, all the way from the far north of Scotland, right the way down to Devon. And a small cluster in Wales, and like I say, they're fairly evenly scattered. But when you think about the size of the country, that isn't an awful lot of trials. And the photographs you'll see there, the top left photo is Glen Tress in Scotland. That's a species trial uh, in the borders. On the right hand side is the um, operational species trial. And um, this is the trial that's up at Sherwood 9, so up near Clumber Park. And you can quite clearly make out the quite large blocks, these 0.1 hectare blocks of a range of species. 
Immediately below that is a more recent trial, again, an operational trial where we've got a testing a range of broadleaves. And this is at Western Common, quite near us uh, at Alice Hole. And these are two year old uh, Liriodendron tulip tree uh, doing quite nicely. And then the immediately the last photograph, the bottom left of the series, that's at um, that's one of our short rotation forestry trials. And that's the one at Brecon. Um, there's, there's, there are a series of three of them in, in Wales, again, doing very well and still being assessed and providing us with some very good information. So we've got quite a, a, an asset there we are tapping into. And the intention is to keep managing these long term. But I'd love to see a lot more spots on the map. So operational species trials, a little bit of a cue. This again, this is you just have a quick look at the one for Sherwood. Uh, this is an aerial view. Uh, you can quite clearly, distinctly see the layout. The species that are doing particularly well there, not necessarily relevant to whales, are things like um, Law uh, Leyland cypress. Mm, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a one to talk about. Uh, Leyland cypress, maritime pine. Weymouth pine has done quite well. So, you know, there's a little block of one of the giant redwoods. Again, it's doing quite well on these sandy loams, these acid sands. Um, and, and, and but we're getting some good data back from the nose. And you can see from the pictures, survival has been very good. This is 10 years old. Weymouth pine, not one you've seen a huge amount of around the country, prone to certain diseases like white pine blister rust, which is one of the reasons why it wasn't more, more widely planted. I notice I'm getting short on time here. Um, but one I think that has more potential, particularly maybe as mixed part of mixtures. Again, we'll bring that up a bit later. Uh, Pinus pukey. This is one I think has got a lot of potential, very good survival, very good growth. But you can put that next to a species like Sitka and Sitka will be 10 metres tall and this will be two metres tall after 10 years. It's very, very slow to establish. And this is a common problem with a lot of those species that we are particularly interested in or have very good potential to be uh, new species for forestry. It's establishment. It's the amount of time they take. It's the amount of time they take in the nursery. And I'm sure other people will bring that up later. And it's whether we want to spend, you know, five to six or even more years cleaning and weeding to get something which we would traditionally maybe only spend maybe two, maximum three years in maintaining the weed to get a crop. Uh, on the short rotation forestry side, this is uh, from the site in Devon. This is uh, Eucalyptus nitens. These are 10 year old trees. And you can see uh, from a productive point of view, if you're looking for a chip crop or you've got something that you want to plant as a short rotation forestry, maybe if under agroforestry conditions, uh, that has potential to produce a lot of biomass. But eucalyptus are quite a controversial subject, depending on who you talk to. Um, um, to, our, to our mind, they have potential. We'd still need to further investigate things like potential for invasiveness. Um, but there's uh, there's a lot of work that we're still doing on the sidelines to, to give more detail on these. Uh, the reinforced trials, um, as you can see from the map there, they start all the way down in these ores and go up to Mull. There's a series of 30 species, three provenances of each. Uh, we've just done the 10 year data uh, assessment and a colleague of mine is now uh, writing that up and hoping to produce a paper fairly shortly um, on summarising where that's got to. Uh, very early on, you can see that you know, from our list of species, things like carob, which was on there, did not survive very far north. And Douglas first starts to struggle the further south you get. But the whole point of that project was to test a range of species, exactly the same species, exactly the same provinces across a latitudinal gradient from the Azores to Mull. So we get an idea of climate adaptation across those species. And we already know that if we're looking at using some of those species in the UK, it's those ones in the north of Spain, south of France. They're the provinces that have done well there that are likely to do well here, particularly in the east of the country. So they're giving us a whole set of uh, really good information. The, the big picture there actually is the trials at Western, but uh, they're relatively small. They're only 12 tree plots. So from a statistical point of view, we don't get a lot of good timber information, but we do get survival and, and health information. Uh, but on the reinforced trials, we've got things like liquid amber. Uh, that's actually planted at one of our trials at Clandovery. It's doing quite well. A very nice timber broadleaf tree. Um, 
Pinus tida, lob lolly, uh, another species that is a huge productive forestry species, particularly in the States, other parts of the world. Uh, something that we've just started trialing, but is actually proving to be quite robust and produce some quite nice, nice trees. But also these, these trials really do give us an idea of what won't work. Um, Ponderosa pine was a front runner uh, to, to start with as a replacement for Corsican pine on some of the drier parts of the country. But as you can see, it is absolutely devastated by Dothostroma, the same disease that's hitting Corsican pine. So unfortunately, it is no longer on our list for species to trial. Um, it really did, does suffer. And it's such a shame. It's a really potentially a very, very good tree. So on the species research trials, uh, again, I've got a quick, quick picture here of uh, Western Burt. This is the species blocks. You can see these 49 tree plots and there's 24 different species there. Again, producing some quite good information. These are red oaks uh, up at Glen Tress. I think red oak has a potential uh, as, a, as a good alternative broadleaf tree. Uh, this is Pinus radiata over in Brams Hill. And surprisingly enough, radiata don't quite well on the trials we have in Wales. Um, I think the issue with these is really going to be more to do with uh, wind blow. They're very fast growing. If you can keep the wind away from them, they're likely to stay standing upright. Um, and this is a quick uh, picture of one of the trials at um, Western Boat. You've got Cryptomere japonica. You can see Scots pine, there's birch. There's a whole range of species in there. That's quite an old photograph, and they really have come on since then. So what's happening in Wales? What are we actually doing specific to Wales? Well, I thought I'd quickly summarise what the, the main sort of stocking um, of productive conifers is on the NRW estate. hope I'm not treading on any toes here. This is just on NRW. But as you can see, it's dominated by Sitka spruce, as you would expect, with a few species then still being... So th this is the actual holding. This is hectares planted on the ground up until uh, 2024. So you see Douglas fir, Norway spruce. XL is larches. Well, that's that is going to disappear over time. We don't have any, any suitable replacements. But as you can see, there's been, there are a whole range of other potential productive species, but very small numbers and in very small amounts. And when you get down to the far end, things like Cedrus Atlantica, uh, uh, giant redwood, they are probably trial plots of species that are included on the subcompartment database. So you can see, we've got an issue still. There's a lot there we could do because it's dominated by Sitka. So what I'm looking at emerging species, uh, these particular ones I'm looking at here, you can see that the, the front runners that's been planted since 2010 on in, on the public forest estate in, in Wales, it, OMS, OMS, Serbian spruce has come out top. You see the most popular alternative of Serbian spruce, red cedar, noble fir, grand fir and western hemlock slowly going down to smaller numbers of each. So there's quite, there was quite an effort uh, to, 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 to start to diversify the forests. Um, but of course, a lot of these species are still relatively unknown from a timber point of view, and we're still working our way through, you know, how best to use them as an end product. So just a quick couple of graphs, you see, so if I look at Serbian spruce bottom left, you know, quite a bit of it planted, you see a peak in 2012, and then tailing off to about 2020. And this is quite common with a lot of these species, so there's an initial quite big effort, and then people start to realise they were difficult to grow, they were maybe difficult to um established and some of those um efforts tailed off a little bit west red cedar is still quite a strong still a strong, strong planting in wales um, but serbian spruce as you can see you know over, over 174 hectares of it's planted since 2010 out of a total of 190 so that suddenly you've got quite a lot of extra serbian that you didn't have before um, the other big trial that we have is at Clandovery, uh, 51 and 52. This is in the Cricken Forest. The top half of the site is our FR species trial, so larger plots of, of species. And the bottom half of the site is the reinforced trial. This is well worth a visit if you want to get an idea of how things are doing. And again, we're in the process of writing this up and making that information for the performance of these um, uh, more readily available. Uh, the other things we're looking at are things like the old forest garden. Some of you will be familiar with Brekfa, uh, Brekfa 15, an old forest trial uh, running right through the middle. There are a whole range of ABs and they really do the show, show the potential for ABs 
as a species in Wales for productive forestry. It's just they're very slow to establish. And, you know, we've been through there. Uh, this is all mapped and now database. So we know what's doing what and where. And we've just gone out and reassessed every single tree. So we've measured every single tree in all the plots and taken some sample plots within the, the better uh, performing ones and we're hoping to do a write-up this year which will follow up a write-up that was done in the 1990s by Dan Me and Mason so it'll give us another clearer idea of what's performing well to now um, so that's actually quite a nice site and well worth a visit if you get a chance so what are we considering for the future um, I'll rush through these last few uh, well, we've got things like Arboretum, first stage assessment. You can see from the map there, we have a whole range of these trials we can go back to. The main picture is Kilman Arboretum up, uh, up in Scotland. But I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in getting out to all these sites in Wales. Um, I know Brecfa. I don't know any of the others. And um, I had planned to come up and um, see a few of these ones in North Wales as part of this meeting. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend in person, but I'm still planning to do that in the future. Um, so I'm really keen to see what's doing well and look at assessments on some of those. And another site, this is actually uh, um, Linford Arboretum, so most, most easterly of our collections. Again, really good site, really good opportunity to see what's going on. And a quick whiz through one or two of the things that I think may show potential. Uh, one of the Mediterranean species on the left is, is um, AB Silicica, Silicium fir. And of course, there's Metasequoia, the dawn redwood, which grows into an enormous tree. It is the Chinese redwood. It produces massive trees. And this, these are three old trees in a, a, a school playground uh, in central China. Uh, they have potential. Um, uh, there is a lot of work we can do on those. I keep using this word potential all the time. You'll get bored with that one. Um, on some of the broad leaves, black walnut on the left, I think that certainly has a place. I think that's going to do quite well. It's already starting to sell set on one on one on some sites in Thetford where there's black walnut planted. So it's got a potential for natural regeneration. And in the same family, the hickories, um, hickory, shagbart hickory, the carrier family, I think they all have potential. Oaks. Uh, oaks are a massive potential for broad leaves. Uh, the left-hand picture is the scarlet oak, uh, Quercus coccinea, part of the red oak family. And the one on the right is Hungarian oak, Quercus freinetto. And this is one of the species, both these I think we're looking to possibly plant as part of the reinforced network, the next round of trials. Uh, and then there's a few really sort of fly off, fly on the wall ones. This is Taiwania cryptomerioides. Um, it's the Chinese coffin tree. Uh, we've got one plot of that, and this is actually at Bedgebury, um, and it's doing very, very well. Um, oh, someone's taken control of the presentation. OK, uh, next slide, please. Uh, to give you an idea what diversification could look like, this is actually from a trial that was planted actually out in the, um, uh, it's over in, um, it's in Surrey, Surrey Hills, and you can see a whole range of species have been planted there. I think Gail knows this site. So you can see, actually, you could get some quite interesting, diverse, pit, some, some diverse forests. Uh, Next slide. Please. I was just actually just going to finish off with my last um, thought, really, was to um, say we always use this expression, right tree, right place, right reason. Uh, and I've, always, I've actually come to the conclusion it's completely in the wrong order. We tend to go out sometimes and say, I'd like to plant this tree, not really thinking about what the site is or what your end result should be. And I now you go down the reasoning of you should decide why you're planting the tree. What is it you want it to do? What is it you want to achieve? So your reason. And then you do your site. You look at your site. You look at the conditions of the site. You use your ESC tools. You dig your holes. And from that, you'll get an idea of what might grow. And then that gives you the opportunity to select a list of species that will grow on that site and then be able to give you your end product. Um, so that's really how I wanted to finish off. But anyway, um, thank you for listening. Um, always welcome questions, but it sounds like probably after tea break now. Thank you very much. Well, I can see that you've had quite a few questions in the um, chat that have been- Oh, more than likely. To teams. But I just checked before we we have to break for a coffee break here in Bangor. So I'll just ask if there's any quick questions in the room for Chris. Uh, can you take the microphone? There's one question. 
Talk, talk, talk to, to us about the trees. Uh, we're here to learn about timber quality as well. Um, yeah. Where, where does that come into the equation in your work? Well, that's where our sort of partners in crime within our team, because we're now silviculture and timber properties. Um, so they are the people that are very much leading on that side of it. So I work very closely with them. Um, and that's something I think probably is a, is a separate session. Um, I don't think they were particularly they were invited. So uh, they would be better placed to talk about the um, timber qualities. A lot of these. I mean, a lot of these things share the same. A pine tends to share very similar properties to a pine, a spruce to a spruce. But we need to have that information that's relevant to UK grown material to give us those assurances. Um, so I, I can't really answer the question on that one. Wood Knowledge Wales are holding Wood Build um, 2024 on the second and third of July. Gary's here. You'll talk about it later in his uh, slot this afternoon. But I believe that John Ridley Ellis is coming from Edinburgh Napier University, who's leading some work on timber properties. So I, I didn't want to see this thunder because Gary's got his event on in two weeks' time in Wales and Swansea. Um, but that presentation will be available in Wales in two weeks' time through Gary's event from John Ridley yeah. Ellis. Yeah, yeah, Napier work very closely with our colleagues up at um, Forest Research, so they'll probably find that most of the data will be um, stuff that's also come from Forest Research. So they they, they should be giving you a good a good a good showing. Thank you. We've got another couple of quick questions, Chris, in the room. Mm -hmm. no. Hi, hi, Chris. Uh, yes, yeah, John Healy here. Hi, John. Um, I'm sure. A lot of us would share your enthusiasm for the value that can be obtained from going back to these old species trials and reopening them. I'm sure your staff time is a major limiting resource. Citizen science is proving more and more effective in many domains, biodiversity monitoring, but also observatory, of course, for pests and pathogens. What are the prospects of getting more citizens involved in this or would aspects of risk assessment and so on get in the way or do our students an underused resource for that as well? I, I, to be honest, I'd welcome the opportunity. I mean, if, if I can, I mean, I, I, I do go out to some of these sites and I quite often take uh, either students or um, other foresters that are unfamiliar with them. We would just spend a day just assessing trees. You know, and I think if you've got people that are trained up, uh, are able to take DBH measures, measure the heights of trees and take correct notes, anybody could do it as long as it's been supervised and they've got clear criteria. So I think citizen science could be a good way forward to go and have a look at a lot of these old trials. Sometimes it's just to go to see they're still there. <laughs> One further question here in the room. And, uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, uh, it's Tom, uh, Tom Jenkins. I'm just going to pick up on, uh, just going to pick up on um, Ips, Ips topographers. And just to, uh, while I agree that we've got, we need to diversify the conifer species, um, to ask people not to panic about Ips. Uh, at the moment, all the introductions have been found on Norway spruce. They've all been found on stressed or dying trees. And provided you manage your trees well and they're growing healthily, the likelihood of being attacked by Ips, he said, famous last words, is uh, very low at the moment and re would require huge uh, insect densities way beyond what's being seen in East Anglia. Have to see yeah, thanks, Tom. Chris, there are questions online, but I'm afraid we're going to have to break here now in Bangor. So would you mind having a look through the online questions, if that's all right? Yeah. And thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. No worries.